you, uh, first of all, for coming to Kazakhstan and uh, for giving your public lecture here at the MNU today. First, let me uh, start our conversation uh, from asking you about the perspectives of the partnership between the MNU, Maksud Narukbarov University, and Oxford Center for Islamic Studies, and what uh, and how it will help to foster further academic mobility. Well, we have at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies always placed a high priority on having academic relationships across the Muslim world particularly, but right across the world. Uh, and Kazakhstan, Central Asia is such an important part of that that we always wanted to develop those relationships. We have had a number of Kazakh scholars at the center in the past. We have had agreements with other academic institutions here, but with MNU, particularly with the emphasis on law and the possibility of opening up in many of these new areas and in economic and human development and the context of the importance of, of law and Kazakh history and culture. We believe it provides a good opportunity to encourage scholars on both sides to benefit from each other. We hope that there would, it would provide the mechanism for bringing more scholars from Kazakhstan to the center. As I said, we have had uh, a few uh, people from here, but not as many as we would like to. Mm -hmm. And I hope that encourages uh, that process. Um, so um, we are looking forward to that and to see how we can engage yes. with and different... And you also mentioned uh, that would be very important in promoting dialogue and the promoting the common understanding on the issues that we are facing today. I think it is so important that uh, once we have a good grounding in the basic uh, scholarship, it provides the basis for engaging with many of the issues that confront us today, but on the basis of an informed um, analysis of the real challenges. Right. Otherwise, we would be uh, addressing the, um, the veneer, the, just the outer um, not the real issues, but just the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the picture on the outside. Yes, so you researched Islam and its history for many years, so I'm really interested about your vision of what patterns of development of Islam and Islam studies here in this part of the world can you highlight. Uh, we're talking about the rapid spread of Islam uh, in recent decades and years in this part of the world in Central Asia. So what do you think about it from the um, researcher, researching yes. point of view? Well, I think in order to understand this part of the world, or for that matter, any part of the world, it is important to look at it from within, from, from below, as it were. So this part of the world has made a major contribution to Islamic civilization. Uh, in the past, uh, you have been at the crossroads of uh, the transmission of learning to the West and to the East. Uh, many of the major achievements in science, in architecture, in philosophy, and in religious sciences mm, uh, come back to this part of the world. The movement not only of traders, and, uh, but also of scholars, of, uh, of uh, Sufi orders, of networks. We are talking in the land of Ahmad Yasavi or the, the land of uh, uh, Farabi. Uh, the contribution of this part of the world is immense. But there is a period in which perhaps that has been forgotten or there hasn't been a similar level of contribution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the expansion of Islam is something new. It has been for centuries, going back almost right. to the 8th century. The issue is why there are certain manifestations uh, in society of things which are perhaps not rooted in Islam but are more the result of the modern disruption in society uh, they may be technology-driven, they might be ideology 
driven, they might be economics driven, but this is not about Islam. Mm -hmm. I mean, to understand Islamic civilization and so on, it is so important to emphasize that uh, in different parts of the world, uh, this region has provided the basic knowledge and the scholarship. The major contribution of the muhaddisin, of the scholars of the tradition of the Prophet, mm -hmm. are from Central Asia. Most of the major scholars in philosophy and history, yeah. and they are all from this part of the world. So people were comfortable in who they were. It is not as if Islam was something new. Mm -hmm. There might be instances where some people nowadays have forgotten the basis of the traditional belief and maybe are sometimes mistaken by what is more ideology rather than faith. And that's mm -hmm. a different issue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's also very important to know the historical context always. Uh, but what is important to bear in mind in modern times when uh, we're talking about secularity, the importance of secularity, and also uh, the importance of promoting the values of Islam and the Islamic world? Okay. Yeah. Yes. To, to keep balance between you know, the ideology, politics, and values of the religion. I think when it comes to the modern state, which is basically the state as has developed, say, since Westphalia, it is the modern European state, where there are political boundaries which define the, 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 the state and the law of the land within that state. Uh, one has moved to a new phase where it is the law of the land as uh, promulgated by the legislature of that land, uh, which determines uh, what uh, uh, the actions of uh, the citizenry should be. Now, it is important that the laws of the land provide for the protection of uh, the rights of all citizens. And therefore, in a sense, it is very important that this is done within a secular context, which provides a level playing field for all citizens to be treated uh, equally. Uh, this is what one might say is the basic minimum mm -hmm. that is necessary to uh, have an uh, equality amongst all citizens, and therefore the secular state provides that. And it is the power of the state to enforce those laws that ensures that it is in place, and that creates a tolerance for, for people. But I think coming to it from a civilizational or a religious perspective, if you like, there is a higher level where mm -hmm. of course you follow the law of the land, but you also do the same thing because this is what your religion teaches you to do. Yes. And that is important that we should therefore recognize that it is a proper understanding of uh, the history, the culture, and how we have lived mm -hmm. all these ages. It's not as if our ancestors were any less Muslim than <laughs> we are. <laughs> they in fact were far better Muslims mm -hmm. than yes. we are. But there was that openness. There was an ability to interact with others, to accommodate difference, mm -hmm. and yet maintain your own identity and so on. So that is a very uh, important and yet a very big challenge that all modern societies face, yes. especially those that have a rich heritage. Right. Let me ask you as a researcher, uh, as a researcher at the first place, what should be and should be and should it be a role and responsibility of religions or religious leaders of the Islamic world uh, in the modern geopolitical crisis, if any? And I'm talking particularly now about the Middle East crisis we are now facing and the uh, reaction of the world we have so far. What do you think personally? Is this conflict has a solution and what to do about it from the religious point of view? I think we can have these discussions either in the language of political science or in the language of religion. Mm -hmm. There is a difference when we start talking about issues which are political, but we want to use the language of religion. Right. And there are other issues which are religious and we start using the language of politics. Of course, uh, the basic principle of equality, of justice, of uh, mm, 
similar standards applying to everyone. These are the expectations of everyone. It is not just a religious requirement in today's world. I mean, in many of the issues that you mentioned, uh, the world opinion has changed so significantly. Uh, it is the basic human urge to ensure that justice is being done. We can't live in today's age, uh, in, uh, today in, uh, in a situation where we are following double standards, where uh, we do not put a human face to the suffering of people in, in, in one part of the world, but we do that in other part of the world. Uh, that, uh, and, uh, and on that, no leader can make a difference unless they are honest in the application of the values that are held closely by. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think uh, those issues that uh, international organizations personify and have protected, through the United Nations and others, I think provide the basis but it is important the need to be applied equally and uniformly mm -hmm. across the board. Do you believe in the possibility of, uh, of establishing common grounds or discussion um, when we talk about the modern geopolitical crises and what, what should be the role of religion in, in that? Well, I think the first thing is that you sustain, you, cre you, you establish peace and then you secure it and sustain it. I think in establishing peace, it is really the modern states, it is international organizations, which have a role and a duty to perform that. If, when it comes to the level of sustaining it on an ongoing basis, that is where society leaders, religious leaders, uh, um, leaders of industry, champions of uh, mm -hmm. industry and so on, they have a role to play. But the initial thing is to bring about that peace, to create that space, and then to secure it and sustain it uh, through all sorts of mm -hmm. other uh, activities. And all, uh, all different you know, parts of society should be involved. Yeah, in that, but it would be that at that process. stage when you are sustaining it. Uh, but the initial pressure whether is to create that peace and to bring it about. And then once you have established that peace is then to, in a sense, for people to learn to live together, again, right. to coexist and so on, those things, I think all faith traditions have a lot to contribute to that. Um, but uh, the initial thing is uh, we have those institutions, those mechanisms um, in international agencies, and the requirement is that they do their job Yes. and they do it uh, in an even-handed fashion. Right. Now, please tell us more about historical atlas for the Islamic world. As we know, uh, this is the major program of research of your center. What data, what research uh, it will include and when it will become available to the public? I mean, uh, <coughs> we started off in the hope that we would do the whole world. This was very ambitious. And we soon realized that it is such an ambitious thing. If it needs to be done well, it needs to be done. So um, as different volumes, so we started off with South Asia because we had expertise on that mm -hmm. and we had that support. So what it does, it maps out. Uh, there, are, there are political maps available. What were the boundaries and so on. There are maps uh, sometimes of economic atlases available where things were and so on. But there isn't anything available about the transmission of ideas, transmission mm -hmm. of people, uh, of networks, of religious scholars, right. of uh, so on. So we wanted to trace uh, the intellectual genealogies of people. And mm -hmm. that's where this part of the world becomes very important for South Asia. All the major Sufi orders, all the major schools of law, they all had their roots here. Uh, and they are the people who went out and then uh, it uh, struck root mm -hmm. in, that, in that part of the world. So there is a constant movement of people. Uh, it is not just about conquest, it is about passing the torch of learning, mm -hmm. if you like. So we looked at uh, historical accounts of contemporary accounts of manuscripts and so on and created a database of about uh, a few thousand famous scholars. 
so on. When did they move? Where did they live? Whom did they study with? Whom did they teach? Uh, and so on. And created that genealogies. Mm -hmm. um, now that is very significant, I believe, because uh, for instance, in this part of the world, you talk of the Yasavi order, you talk of the Nakshbandi order. They are all here, but they are connected with people over there. The people who would have gone from this part of the world, mm -hmm. who have important, in, in Central Asia as a whole, and that connectivity right. goes back uh, centuries, almost from 8th century onwards. This is where, so the idea of a center periphery doesn't exist. This, and this is the cultural resource of this part of the world. That, and the great uh, strength of Islamic civilization was that wherever people went and established their colleges mm -hmm. and their thing, that became the center. So in today's world, when you have challenges in one part of the world, I think the responsibility of this part of the world increases because what you have to offer is very different. So than that work would be very essential in understanding the common <coughs> grounds between all of us. I hope so. And when it uh, exactly it will be available? I think it would, should be another two years or so. Okay, it's bi that's a big work. It's very important. And let me be back to this region again, Central Asia, my last question. What do you think of the perspective um, of Central Asian integration? We are talking about similarities in culture, in tradition, traditions, and also in religion, right? So um, can we speak of developing a new kind of re regional identity when we speak about Central Asia? I think both as a student of history and as one who follows contemporary trends, I think there is a unique opportunity and there is a responsibility to encourage that coming together. Central Asia in itself is a very important part of the world in economic terms, mm -hmm. in geostrategic political terms, but also in terms of culture and what it has to offer. You are the best mediator, as it were, between the West and the Muslim world. You are at the confluence of Europe and Asia. You are connected to South Asia. You are, in a sense, what the Silk Road was all about. So, and you have important neighbors, but you also have relationships beyond the immediate neighborhood. So there is a lot that you can do and there is an expectation that you would do that others can benefit from mm -hmm. and indeed the region itself would benefit from. It's not a new identity. It is a, it's the rediscovery of an old identity right. and an old role that you have performed. So I think there are immense possibilities and for people to recognize that the richness of this part of the world is not just in economic terms. The richness of this part of the world is not in terms of its geostrategic um, location, location, but it is about the, 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 the cultural element of it, which is so important today in reaching out. It, you can help redefine the popular understanding of the Islamic world the way people that look a at big, it. Uh, like a very significant, significant role to play. It, it is a very significant, but you have the means to do that. You just have to tell people what you have been doing <laughs> all these <laughs> centuries. Right. Dr. Rahman Nizami, thank you very much again for your time and for your answers. Thank, thank you. you. Very appreciated.